Thank you, Megan, for that. Um, I always like starting out our chapels, whether it's a creed or a benediction or just truths that God believes about us. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I have been looking forward to this for quite some time now. Um, this word's kind of been on my heart for a while, so I'm really excited to get to share with you guys today. Uh, like Megan said, we are going to be in First Peter 2, 11 through 17. So that is what we are going through today. Let me just turn my laptop on here. Um, so I'm go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage for today. Would you guys join me in standing as I read this passage? It should be on the screen above you. It says, "Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us." Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So my, you guys may be seated. Thank you. My main point to you guys today is I'm going to be talking about why we are called to live like Christ in a society that has forsaken him. I forgot to give a little disclaimer at the beginning, but for those of you who don't know me well, um, you probably don't know that my voice tends to crack like a lot. Um, And so... You might hear it crack in these next 15 to 20 minutes, but I actually woke up today with just a good feeling, and I am believing in Jesus' name that we are going to go 15 minutes without my voice cracking. We're going to be crackless in Seattle. There's a good dad joke to start your morning. (laughs) So um, we have heard some great things in our past talks from our speakers in the past. Um, If you've been here for Student Chapel, Um, First week, we had Danny who talked about um, Jesus as our living hope and putting our hope in Jesus. Um, The next week, we had Ariana Thomas who talked about um, a kingdom, give me one second, a kingdom that will never fade away, a kingdom that has eternal value. And then last week, if you were here, we heard from Bella who talked about um, giving Jesus our yes and obedience and just obeying Jesus in everything that we do. And so I'm going to continue on that a little bit in obedience, only I'm going to be talking about a certain type of obedience, and that is the word submission. Everybody say submission. Now, I'm sure if you came in here this morning, um, you were probably not hoping to hear about submission. It's not the friendliest word ever. Um, it's, you're probably thinking, oh, I don't want to start out my week this way, Monday morning. I don't want to learn about submission. But, you know, some of you, some of you may struggle with submission. Some of you maybe look back on your life and think submission is something I have always struggled with. Um, I don't want to hear about this this morning. Some of you may be thinking submission is something I don't have a problem with. I have always um, been, done a good job at submitting my, to my authorities, whether it's my parents um, or my professors or whoever it may be. But I want to tell you today that submission is not a bad word. Um, this section of Peter's letter is all about submission. But before we get into submission, I want to dive into verse 11. Um, and I want to read it from the New King James Version, which says, Abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. And so one of the, one of the dilemmas that we face when it comes to submission, is the flesh. And Peter is calling us to resist the flesh because this is where sinful desires come from and sin wages war against our soul. As you can see in the first verse, that's what it says there. And the thing about sinful desires is they bring temporary satisfaction but cause long-term harm. And this is so hard for us because As human beings, our human nature is to give in to the flesh. It's to give in to these sinful desires. It's not to do the opposite. For those of you who don't really know what the flesh is, our flesh tells us a couple things. And here's a couple things our our flesh tells us. 
And I'm sure some of you guys, as you're sitting there listening to this, you might be able to relate to it. One thing the flesh tells us is to give us what we want when we want it. This is called instant gratification. An example I like to use is food. How many of you guys, when you're hungry, you don't like to wait? You like to just get food, and you want it when you want it. An example of this is a microwave. When you have a microwave, you put something in a microwave, it takes about 30 seconds to two minutes. You usually don't go longer than two minutes. If you're going longer than two minutes, you probably need to use a stove or something. But when you put something in a microwave, um, it takes about 30 seconds, and then it's ready, ready to eat. And when we're hungry, we want something from a microwave, most likely, and not something like a crock pot. You see, a crock pot takes time. A crock pot, you have to plan ahead. You have to plan in advance. It's something you have to meal prep for. Um, you have to lay out the ingredients, let, let it thaw, and then put it in a crock pot, and then it cooks. And let me just tell you, I am not a crock pot person. I am not a meal prepper. Some of you guys, if you're living in the apartments, you might be learning how to meal prep. Um, that'll probably be me next year. Um, luckily, I don't have to do that yet, but I do not do a good job at planning ahead. Um, one of the things I like to use um, just when I am hungry, and if you guys are looking for some great food, I highly recommend this. It's called Jimmy Dean Breakfast Bowls. Um, they say they have like 26 grams of protein, but there's something like in there that's like not on the box that is just really nasty for you, and it makes me feel sick every morning. And so I should probably stop taking them. But that is an example of my fleshly desire is because I want um, this food right away. I don't want to wait. I'm hungry, and I just want to cook it right away, and so Jimmy Dean always comes in clutch. Another example, and if you aren't, if you are a meal prepper, then that one didn't apply to you, but another example is sleep. How many of you love sleep? I love sleep, too. How many of you love sleep, but don't exactly prioritize sleep? I think definitely in college, we're not in a season of prioritizing sleep. And so I'm not saying sleep is a bad thing. Sleep is definitely a good thing. But there comes a time where the flesh plays a role in sleep. And for example, this year we've had to adjust. We've had to go online, remote. Um, some of you may like the Zoom format, some of you probably don't, but we've had to go online and adjust to this new format and one of, the, one of the ways our flesh really kicks in is when we are sleeping in our nice beds. I know from the Red Lion, we have a full size instead of a twin. If you're living in a dorm, shout out anyone at the Red Lion. Um, but those beds are so nice. And when I have a class at 9 a.m., I never want to get out of bed. I just want to lay in there. And that is an example of the flesh playing a role in sleep. On a more deeper level, there are other examples of the flesh. Some of you may struggle with pride. How I like to define pride is taking credit for when God should get the credit. Another example is lust, whether it be materialism, pornography. That's another example of the flesh. And so the question is, how do we win this war? What do we do to abstain from the passions of the flesh? What do we do? How do we win this war? Well, I can tell you what definitely won't win this war. What won't win this war is a list of do's and a list of don'ts, a list of rules and regulations. You see, when we think about it this way, this is playing to lose instead of playing to win. Or actually, how I like to say it is playing not to lose instead of playing to win. And I know this isn't directly stated in Scripture, but as believers, we need to play to win rather than playing not to lose. You see, playing not to lose says, I'm just going to hold back. I'm just going to do my thing. I'm just going to hope I don't fail. But playing to win goes into that thing. And it says, I'm going to resist the flesh. And I like a verse that really relates to this. And it should be on the screen up above. It's Colossians 2, 20 through 23. It says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use. 
are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. You see, regulations and rules, just like this verse talks about, will not win the war. And so what does win the war against the flesh? It's the Holy Spirit that wins the war against the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us power to resist the flesh. It's not a list of rules and regulations, but it is a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit that helps us resist the flesh. A couple of verses I like that talk about this. One of them is Romans 8, 5. It says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Another one is Galatians 5, 16 through 18. And this says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And see, this is the battle we face. We have our soul. And I look at the soul as like right in the middle, and there's two things fighting for our soul. We have the flesh, and we have the Spirit. And our natural human inclination is to give in to the flesh when we are called to give in to the Spirit. See, when we live according to the Holy Spirit, he tells us what to do and he guides our steps in the right direction. When we listen to the Holy Spirit, it puts the flesh to death. Living in accordance to the Spirit also helps us submit to our authorities. This is what Peter is trying to tell the believers when writing to them. For context, Peter is writing to these believers um, in 1 Peter. And these were people who were under oppressive, abusive Roman authority. So it was not easy for them to submit to authority. Yet Peter still writes them and tells them to. Their persecution was unjust. But Peter still told them to submit to authority for God's sake. And so like I mentioned earlier, I want to tell you submission is not a bad thing. Verse 13 says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. So why do we submit? Why do we submit? We submit for the Lord's sake. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so that's it. The root of our submission is in our love for him. That is why we submit. It's because we love Jesus and we have a personal relationship with him. We don't do it because we're forced to. We don't do it because we have to. We don't do it because it's some chore that we wake up every day and say, oh, time to submit. We do it because we love God and we want to keep his commandments. When I was growing up, my, um, my mom used to always tell my twin brother and I, Luke, he's sitting right here, um, she used to always tell us, if you love me, you will obey me. And back then, I didn't really get the point. I had no idea it was even a biblical principle, but now it makes so, sense, so much sense. And now I know that that is a biblical principle. She wanted to understand that my obedience was tied to our love. Yes, our, our home had rules, We had house rules, you know, we had to do this and that. But at the end of the day, those rules were in place because of the parents, because of the rules my parents had in place. Or I'm sorry, because of the love my parents had for me. And it's the same thing with God. God loves us, so we need to submit. And so you might be thinking, well, it's actually pretty easy for me to submit to my heavenly authority. That's not a problem for me but it might be a problem for you to submit to your earthly authorities. Who are some of our earthly authorities? 
Well, we have our parents. Some of you might be looking back on your lives just, you might be glad that school is an escape because you don't have to submit to your parents' authority anymore. We have our parents. We have professors. Even higher than that, we have our governor. We have our president. As believers, we are called to a higher standard. And although this isn't directly stated in the passage, I believe what Peter is telling the believers here is we are called to live as disciples rather than just believers. How many of you in here would say you're a believer? You can raise your hand. You're definitely a believer. But what would it look like if we lived as disciples? One way I like to think of a disciple is someone who is constantly learning. And by learning, we have to submit to our authorities. In our final verse, verse 17, it says, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. It does not say to only show respect to those who are respectable, but to respect everyone, even if they're not respectable. And this may look like respecting people who you've never really had a general respect for, whether it be people that think differently than you, people that look differently than you, even people that vote differently than you. I especially think that last one is important just in the season we're about to go through, this season of an election, which is usually a very polarizing season in our nation. How can we, as a body of Christ, be respecting people even if they vote differently than us? And lastly, it does not say to only honor the emperor, king, president, whoever it may be. Only if they are honorable, it doesn't say that, but to honor them even if it is a challenge for you. And so I want to leave you guys with this. What would it look like if we demonstrated our love for God through our submission to our authorities? What would it look like if we truly lived as disciples rather than just believers? What would it look like if we were truly led by the Holy Spirit rather than the flesh. Will you guys pray with me? God, I thank you so much for this word in First Peter. Um, I thank you for all the commands you give us, submitting to our authorities, avoiding the desires of the flesh. God, I pray that when we read those passages, God, when we read those scripture verses, that we would just take it to heart, that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, God, but also doers. That we would live according to the Holy Spirit, God. That we wouldn't live according to the flesh. Lord, that we would submit to all of our authorities, whether it be our heavenly authority or our earthly authorities, God. Parents, professors, whoever it may be, RAs, Lord, submission is not always an easy thing. But by the grace of your Holy Spirit, we can submit. And so, God, I pray that over everyone this morning, that we would walk by the Spirit, that we would live according to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.